Good morning, Gabrielle. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can't hear you. I'm not sure if you're, uh, I don't know if you're muted. I don't think you are. I wonder if your audio is working, Gabrielle. All right, good morning, everybody. I just need a little bit of uh, feedback here to make sure everybody can hear me. Okay, thank you. Max, just a reminder, I'd like to see see your smiling face, thanks. No, it doesn't seem to be smiling, but I need, need to at least see your face, thanks. All right. So we're going to start off with uh, titration curves today. Now this test, I think, test two is probably the worst of all the tests. There's a, it's, I think it's got the sort of the hardest material in it, but this, that just means that you have to, you have to start a bit earlier on some of it so that you, you get through it all and that you don't end up falling short on time at the end, which I think some of you did with the last test. All right, so let's take a look at titration curves. Now, first of all, let's look at a titration. Generally, a titration consists of two parts. You've got a burette. It's not a very good diagram, I know. And you've got a flask. So if you've got a flask that has, uh, let's say, something called A in it, and then you've got a burette that has something called B in it, then what we could say is that A is being titrated with B. So whatever's in the flask is A and whatever's in the, in the burette is B. And that's, a tr that's the main thing that you really need to be aware of because then you, then you have an idea of what goes on on what axis when we're talking about the, the actual titration curve itself. So the first one we're going to look at here is the titration curve of HCl with NaOH. So what that means is in the first one, we'll have sodium hydroxide in the burette, we'll have HCl in the flask. So again, it's the HCl being titrated with the sodium hydroxide. And 
what that means is we put this titration curve here and we'll have the volume of well it's volume of NaOH but this always will be the volume of whatever's in the burette so whatever's in whatever you're actually doing the titrating with is going to be I'd like somebody to somebody seems to be I'd like you to mute please whoever it is somebody's uh got a little background noise and on the other axis we'll have ph now it makes sense that it's volume of b that goes on the x-axis because that's what we're measuring from into the hcl and we're always measuring how many mils we're adding from the burette and what's going to be in the flask will be a fixed amount of a uh, volume so it doesn't make any sense but that would go on the x-axis down here now at the beginning all we have is just hcl in the flask so the ph is going to be one and then we go up to 14, which is going to be the pH of sodium hydroxide. And the way that these usually go is there's a, first of all, a bit of a, a bit of a rise at the beginning, and then we have a big jump, and then it goes up to, up to 14 here. And in the middle, we call that the equivalence point. And this is where the moles of A equal the moles of B. All right, let's talk a little bit about the pH scale before we go too much further here. I think most of you are aware of the pH scale, or at least on some level. But let's talk about just some uh, reference numbers here, just so you're completely aware of what's going on with the pH scale. Why that's not moving over. All right. I guess that's as far as it goes. So pH of one, we'll do five, we'll do seven, nine, and then 14. And pH of one, that's going to be strong acid. And then at five, you've got weak acid. Seven is neutral. Nine is weak base. And 14 is strong base. I think you've, I think most of you have seen this before. Now, the other thing about pH is that, and we'll, we'll get into this a lot more in a, in, a, in a while, is that pH is a logarithmic scale, which means that if you've got, say, pH of, pH of 1, and we're going up to a pH of 3, then the actual pH, the pH is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration which means hydrogen ion concentration is actually 10 to the negative pH. So it would be go, we'd be going from 10 to the negative one molar H plus to 10 to the negative three molar. So that would mean that this is actually a hundred times more acidic. pH of one is a hundred times more acidic than uh, pH of three. And this is reflected also in this curve here is why we get this curve is because it's a logarithmic scale. It's not, it's not a true, true, true scale because it goes to t each one is 10 times more than the, than the previous one. And that's why we get this big jump here when we get to the equivalence point. Does anybody have any questions so far?
All right, so uh, let me let me go down here and talk a little bit about strong acids and strong bases and weak acids and weak bases. And this here is a, it gives you at least an idea of what I mean by strong acid and strong base and weak acid and weak base. So strong acids, strong acids will dissociate 100% when they're put into water. So if you have HCl and you put it into water, it'll, it'll uh, dissociate 100% into H plus and Cl minus. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base. It will do likewise, and it will split up into 100% Na plus and OH minus. And my definition of what an acid and base is, acid is something that forms H plus in water, and bases usually form OH minus in water. Now the weak acids and bases will dissociate only slightly. So if you take a look at something like acetic acid, which is this CH3COOH, it's the main component of vinegar. It actually only dissociates 3% when you put it into water. And likewise, ammonium hydroxide, which is what you get when you put ammonia into water, will only dissociate 2%. So those are considered to be weak acids and bases respectively. So if you're trying to figure out what a strong acid and a weak and a strong base might look like, then what you can say is the strong acids I've got listed here, sulfuric, hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, nitric and perchloric, those are the main ones that are considered to be strong acids. Pretty much any other acid you deal with is going to be a weak acid. And with strong bases, you've got all these hydroxides these tend to be very strong bases and anything else again would be, would tend to be a weak base. Does anybody have any questions? Will you have to memorize that? No, you won't actually, because I usually tell you, if certainly if it's important, I'll always tell you if uh, something is a strong acid or a strong base or a weak acid or a weak base. So you won't need to, to memorize that, but I'm just giving you that as a little bit of background and so you can easily determine strong acids and strong bases and weak acids and weak bases. So again, we're starting down here at a pH of one. And that's because at the beginning, the volume of sodium hydroxide is zero because that's how much has been put into the flask, which is nothing from the burette initially. So the pH we're dealing with at the beginning is just one. So that's zero, that's zero mils right there. Then as we add in the sodium hydroxide, you can see the pH goes up slightly until the moles of A equal the moles of B till the moles of HCl equal the moles of sodium hydroxide, at which case we're dealing with a neutral solution. And then it goes up to a pH of 14 because after that, all of the acid is gone and all we're putting into the solution now is just base. So the pH goes up to 14, which is going to match the pH of the strong base that's being added, which is sodium hydroxide. Does anybody have any questions? You're not seeing my screen. Oh, sorry, Christina, I don't know why that might be. Is every, everybody else seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, thanks, Marta. Christina, I'm sorry, the problem must be at your end and I don't know why. All right, uh, let's talk about the reaction here that's going to be what's happening at the equivalence point. This is when we've got uh, HCl and NaOH I'm going to give you, I'm going to draw some pictures here just to give you a better idea about what's going on pictorially. I'm not going to do this for all of them, obviously, it would just be too time consuming. But I am going to, I am going to show you sort of exactly what's happening as we proceed through the titration. So let's say at the beginning we might have, and well, I'm going to do this a bit bigger. So let's say at the beginning, we might have three HCLs in the solution. And if we add one sodium hydroxide to that, 
this is what's going to happen. So one NaOH will react with one HCl and we will get NaCl plus H2O. All right, just a reminder how we get that. So it's Na plus and OH minus is going to be the base. H plus and Cl minus is going to be the acid. The OH minus and the H plus join together. That gives the water. And then the Na plus and the Cl minus join together. And that gives the NaCl. Does anybody have any questions so far? Will you tell us like which one is a base and which one is an acid? I actually will, but you can always tell anyway because the H, the acid will always produce the H plus and the base will always produce the OH minus. Okay. okay. But it's not usually going to be necessary for you to, to know which is which because I'll usually tell you you're right. So if we're looking at this reaction, so we'll get NaCl. I'm not going to put the water in here because it's already aqueous. But you can see that after we've added one equivalent of NaOH and we had three equivalents of HCl in here, then we'll get NaCl and we'll have now we'll have two HCls in there. So I'll add another NaOH. And this is what you're doing during, during the titration. NaCl, NaCl and now HCl. So now we add in another NaOH. And we've got NaCl, NaCl, and NaCl. At this point, we're at the equivalence point. Because we've added equal amounts of sodium hydroxide to the HCl that we had in there in the first place. See, so far we've added three NaOHs and there were three HCLs. And you can, you can see, you can get an idea of why the pH has gone up. And that's because, that's because the HCl has been eaten up slowly and we're just now getting NaCl in the solution. But once we're at the, P, at the equivalence point, you can see the pH is going to be seven because that's all the sodium chloride is going to, to do is it's not really acidic or basic. So it's not going to change the pH at all from seven. And then after that, we can add one more NaOH and we'll still have all the NaCl in the solution, but we don't have any HCl anymore. So we'll have the NaCl still there. And now we'll have NaOH, which is why the pH is going to go up to, to 14 after that point. So that's what's going to ha be happening pretty much in all of these titrations. We, you know, we're adding something from the burette. It's eating up whatever's in the flask. And we're, it's always undergoing some sort of chemical reaction, like, we, like I'm showing you here. It's a double displacement reaction, something you would have learned about back in Intro to Chem or in uh, General Chemistry 1. Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay. Now, what if we, we flipped it around now and we do the titration curve of NaOH with HCl? So what that means is that in the flask, we'll have now NaOH and in the burette, we'll have HCl. So the pH or the titration curve is going to look something like this. We'll be having the volume of HCl because that's what's in the burette. And we're going to be starting at a pH of 14, which is the which is the pH of sodium hydroxide before we add any of the HCl to it. Then if we add, as we add the HCl, same thing happens as before. We get that chemical reaction occurring and it finishes at a pH of one. And the equivalence point here 
is going to be seven. Now sometimes I'll, I'll put 13 or 14 here. And the reason I might do that is just because it makes the equivalence point calculation a little bit easier because I can go 13 plus one divided by two is seven. And that will give me the equivalence point. So where it starts to where it finishes, generally the equivalence point is about halfway in between, which is, which is useful information because it can tell you what's going on at the equivalence point. Does anybody have any questions so far? So when you compare the two pH, uh, sorry, the two titration curves, you can see they're just mirror images of each other because we're changing what's in the burette with what's in the flask. Okay, so let's do what happens now if we have a strong base and a weak acid. So things are going to get a little bit different here. So what we're doing here is sodium hydroxide with acetic acid. So the so the sodium hydroxide is in the flask. The acetic acid is in the burette. And I'm calling the acetic acid AA. It's a little bit easier for me to write. So pH will be on the Y axis. On the X axis, we'll have volume of acetic acid. So whatever's in the burette goes there. Now the, at the beginning, we just have pH of 14. And then at the end, we're going to have a pH of five. Now, the reason for that is because acetic acid is a weak acid and the pH would be expected to be five at the very end of this. Now we go through, we do the, we do the thing here. We'll do, I'll do 13 for the pH just to make things a little bit easier and make the math work out a little bit better. 13 plus five divided by two is nine. So that's what the equivalence point is going to be for this one, it's going to be nine. And that gives us some interesting information because if I've got the acetic acid, the way it splits apart and forms the H plus is like this. So the H plus comes off and we've got the negative charge on the rest of it. Then we've got Na plus and OH minus. So the H plus and the OH minus join together, that forms the water. And then the Na joins together with the, Na plus joins together with the CH3, COO minus, and we end up getting the salt here. So what that tells us is that everything here is weakly basic. So that's at the equivalence point. And we know that because the equivalence point is nine, which is weak base. So we know that whatever's being formed there by the reaction is also forming a, a weak base as well. So that's what the, that's what the curve basically looks like. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Let's look at the the next one, which is strong base with, uh, sorry, acetic acid with sodium hydroxide. So the, now the acetic acid is in the, now the acetic acid is in the flask here. And in the burette, we'll have the sodium hydroxide. Now this one's a little bit different than what we might expect. So 
So we'll have volume of NaOH on the x-axis, so pH on the y-axis. The starting pH is going to be 5, which is going to be the acetic acid pH. And then it's going to go up to 14, which is the sodium hydroxide pH. We'll say 13, just to make the math a bit easier. Again, the equivalence point is going to be 9. But we're going to get something else here that we didn't get in the previous one. And that's called a buffer region. So what is a buffer region? Well, we're going to get into buffers a lot more in about a week or a week and a half. And a buffer is, the definition of buffer is as follows. A buffer is a mixture of a weak acid and its conjugate base that resists changes in pH upon addition of strong acid or strong base. All right, so I, I know you, you're probably reading that and you're saying, well, look, I understand what each of these words means, but I have no idea what a weak acid is or a conjugate base or, yeah, I, I, I get that. I mean, I, I, I might have expected that you might have seen some of these terms before, but I'm going to go through them now just to make sure you do, do understand exactly what I mean by each of these. I've already been through weak acid, what a weak acid is. A weak acid is one of those that doesn't dissociate completely. But when I talk about a conjugate base, in order to get a conjugate base of anything, if you've got an acid, which I'm calling AH, to get the conjugate base, you remove H plus. And what that means is the conjugate base here would be A minus. If you wanted to get the conjugate acid of a base, what you would do is you would add H plus, and that would be AH. So the bottom line here is if you've got a weak acid, which I'm calling AH, its conjugate base will be A minus, and it's resisting changes in pH upon addition of strong acid or strong base. In this case, we're adding strong base here, and the pH, the buffer region, is, is that this area here is kind of flat, plateauing, it plateaus, which means that the pH isn't changing very much in this region. That's why it's called a buffer region because the pH is fairly stable here. And it's because we're forming this buffer. Now we're, we are going to get into buffers in a bit, but I'm going to show you sort of in picture form how this buffer is actually not changing the pH very much. And I can do that by just drawing a series of pictures here. So I'm just going to have we'll, have, we'll have two AHs in here, AA, whoops. 
the acetic acid, which I'm going to call AH. And we'll have two AHs in there. And then we'll have the sodium hydroxide being added. The reaction, as you can see <coughs> on the screen here, is one I just went through. So what we do, what we get when we add the first equivalent of sodium hydroxide is we get the we get the A minus and we get AH. So I'll just do that a different way here. So AH plus OH minus. I'll just remove the sodium there, which is a spectator. So that's really the same as NaOH. And this is the same as NaA. But, you know, again, the sodium is a spectator, so we can get not, not worry about it too much. And then we add another sodium hydroxide and then we have just the A minus in solution. But at this point here, what we have is a mixture of A minus and AH, which is a mixture of a weak acid and its conjugate base, which is why we end up getting this plateau here where the pH doesn't change very much because the sodium hydroxide is reacting with the weak acid and turning into weak base at this point. And we're just getting that buffer region. Buffers are very important. We'll get into them later, but this is what's going on here. If you want a, a quick and dirty way of knowing whether or not you're going to see a buffer region, first of all, so buffer region, if you're just, look, just looking for a rule, Buffer region occurs with weak acid or base I should have um, actually I might just I'm running out of room here. I'm going to just write it on this new new slide here. Buffer region occurs when weak acid or base is titrated with strong acid or base. but it won't occur the other way around. So when you had the strong base being titrated with the weak acid, that didn't happen. This is the, this is the previous example. We didn't get the buffer region. And the reason is because at the beginning, you've got your sodium hydroxide in the flask and the AH is being added and all you're getting is a mixture of OH minus and A minus. Remember that the reaction is AH plus OH minus gives A minus plus H2O. And this is not a buffer. Remember a buffer is a mixture of a weak acid in its conjugate base, not a mixture of a strong base and a weak conjugate acid. So there is no buffer there. That's why there isn't a buffer region here. But if you're looking for a rule, 
that's what you're looking for. A buffer region will occur when a weak acid or base is titrated with a strong acid or a strong base. So remember, this has to be in the burette. And the weak acid or base has to be in the flask. And that wasn't the case here. This is what's in the burette. And this is what's in the flask. Okay, does anybody have any questions so far? That's not the end of buffers. I mean, we'll be talking about buffers a whole lot more, but I wanted to give you something a little bit, a little bit of background here to give you some context as to sometimes why we get buffer regions, why sometimes we don't. Does anybody have any questions at all? Okay. Now, what about strong acid and weak base? So here's where doing the titration curve of HCl with NH3. So the HCl is in the flask and the NH3 is in the burette. So I'll leave this rule here and we'll see if we're going to get a, a buffer region or not. So again, the, let's see, we'll look at what's in the flask. In the flask, we've got the HCl. In the burette, we've got the NH3. The NH3 is weak, weak base. and the H cell is a strong acid. So it starts out as the pH of one, which is the, which is the H cell. And in the burette, we have the weak base volume of NH3 down here. The pH at the end will be a pH of nine because NH3 is a weak base. And the pH curve looks like this, but there's no buffer. And if you look at my rule there, the buffer region will occur when the weak acid or base is in the flask and is titrated with the strong acid or base, which is in the burette. See, that's not the case here. The NH3 here is in the burette and the HCl is in the flask. So we don't get this buffer in this case. Does anybody have any questions so far? When we look at the reaction at the equivalence point, now the equivalence point is going to be in this case, nine plus one divided by two, which is five. And you can see that when we do the the reaction with H plus and Cl minus with the weak base, which is NH4 plus and OH minus. And that joins together, we get water, H2O plus NH4Cl, which tells us that this is going to be weakly acidic. at the equivalence point. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Okay, if we reverse it now, and we're doing now the titration of the NH3 with the HCl. So now we've got the HCl in the burette and we've got the NH3, which is in the flask. The HCl is a strong acid. The NH3 is a weak base. We'll have pH on the y axis. We'll have volume of HCl on the x axis. We're going to start out at a pH of nine because that's what NH3 is. 
we'll get the buffer region here. Then it'll go down to a pH of one, which is what HCl is. The equivalence point again will be nine plus one divided by two, which is five. And here we will have a buffer region. And it's, again, the rule here, buffer region occurs when a weak acid or base, which is the NH3 in this case, is titrated with the strong acid or base, and that's HCl in this case that was in the burette. So we do expect a buffer region for this one. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. We don't do the weak acid and weak base case because it's too hard to predict what the equivalence point is going to be like because we don't know what we're going to really see at the equivalence point. Now the last, the last thing I've got here is about selecting an indicator and you know what indicators do because you've seen it, you've seen them when you do the titrations, they're the things that change colour in the solution. But they change colour because the pH changes and they change colour across a pH range. And the common indicators that we use are bronchresol green, which changes colour between 4 and 5.5, and uh, phenol red between 6.5 and 7.5, and phenylphthalene between 8.5 and 10. So what we're looking at here is uh, an indicator change will color will change will indicators will change color across a range of pH. A good indicator will ideally include the pH of the equivalence point in the range. So if we were looking at this example here, we see the equivalence point is five. I think we'd be inclined to use bronchresol green. You don't have to memorize these by the way, I give you these pH ranges, but whatever includes the equivalence point, that will be the best indicator. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, let's look at the kinds of questions you're going to see on the test here. That relate to what we've just done. Okay, so question one, which titration curve best matches the situation described below? So somebody was asking whether you'd be told about weak acids or strong acids and strong acids and weak bases and whatever. Then it, this is this is the kind of context in which you'll be given the question. So you won't even really have to figure that out because you're just told straight what we're dealing with here. And it says here, just to be really clear, it says strong acid titrated with weak base. So let's look at the situation we're dealing with. So you've got strong acid, which I'm going to just abbreviate as SA in the flask. And we have weak base in the burette. So we're looking to see what kind of curve we're going to be looking at here. We'll have volume of weak base will be on the x-axis, we'll have pH on the y-axis. The starting pH will be a pH of one because that's what strong acid is. And the ending pH will be a pH of nine because that's what the weak base is. Anybody have any questions so far? And then we draw a curve and it's going to look like this. The equivalence point will be five. It's about halfway in between the two. And then we have to figure out if we're gonna get a buffer region or not. And I got in the rule here, buffer region occurs when weak acid or base is titrated with strong acid or base. You can see that that's not the case here. The weak base is in the burette, not in the flask. So we're not going to get a buffer region. So no buffer region here. So you'd have to go with the answer that would, that would have not wouldn't have the buffer region on it. And some, some do and some don't. 
so you can see the this one here wouldn't be right because that's got volume of acid on there volume of base would be right but the uh, there's no buffer region there and again we just have to start out at one and go up to nine volume of base and I think this would have to be the answer here does anybody have any questions about answering question one all right Okay, this is uh, this tends to be quite challenging for a lot of students. Is this this business of what we do with um, reactions, especially especially if we and you'll notice here I do have the I tell you if it's a strong acid or a strong base or a weak acid or a weak base. I'm going to show you how you can handle these, and I'm actually going to show you there's really two cases that we deal with here. One I think is a little bit easier to deal with than the other. But if you've got H A plus, and we'll go with N A B. Actually, we won't do that. We'll say N A O H. Then we deal with this, especially, well, actually I'll, I'll do this here, strong acid, strong base, because you are told whether it's a strong acid or a strong base, so to be fair. If it's a strong acid, then you automatically take the H and make it the H plus, and whatever's left will become A minus. I'll stop there for a second. Does anybody have any questions about that? How you how you deal with a strong, strong acid? I'll do this example in a second. And then the other one, we've got Na plus and OH minus being the strong base and the H plus and the OH minus join together to give water and the rest of it joins together to give the, the, the other salt. So that's one case. The other case is one like this where we don't have an obvious source of OH minus. It's still a base, but it's not something that's an obvious source of OH minus. I'll, I'll go into why it's a base in a second. So how do we deal with that? Well, we know that the first one is a strong acid because we're told it is. And that means it's going to be H plus and F minus. Does anybody have any questions about that? How I know it's H plus and F minus? It's really important you understand this. But this other one doesn't have an obvious source of OH minus. So how do we deal with that? Well, what we do is we know it's going to be CH3O minus and K plus. Now, how do I know that? Well, the K here is going to be K plus because it's in group one. So it's uh, it's going to be the, the counter ion to whatever's here. And the reason that CH3O minus is a strong base is because when we put it into water, it becomes CH3OH plus OH minus, which is why it's basic to begin with. That's that's the that's the reason behind it. Does anybody have any questions about that? So what do you deal with? What do you do with that then? Well, we just treat it the same way as we did the previous one. The F minus will go with the K plus and the H plus will go with the CH3O minus. So we're going to get CH3OH plus KF. All right, and that'll be the answer you'd put in there. Does anybody have any questions? So what was the reason that you chose K again to be separated? Because K is in group one and will always form a positive ion. 
What do you mean by group one? It's in the periodic table, Alexandra. Okay, that's what I thought. So if you look at the, you know, you look at the, the group one elements, it's lithium, sodium, potassium, etc. Those are all, mm. those are all going to have one valence electron. And when it loses that valence electron, they become positive as ions. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to come back and I'm going to do some more of these examples in a minute. We'll look at number three here which indicator is best to use with the following titration, strong acid with strong base. So what you, what you should probably do there is draw the curve, draw a little picture of what's going on. So strong acid is in the flask, strong base is in the burette. We're going to start out at a pH of one, we're going to go to a pH of 14. And the pH of the equivalence point is going to be around seven, halfway in between the two. So you would just choose the one that is going to fall in that pH range, which would be phenol red. That would be your answer. Does anybody have any questions about number three? Usually people don't have too much trouble with that one. Okay, so that could be any combination there of strong acid, strong base, weak acid, strong base, whatever. Okay, so those are the main questions. I'm going to I'm going to re-roll this, and we'll do some more examples of number two. Alexander, do you want me to pull up a periodic table to show you to answer that question a bit better? Uh, no, I actually have one in front of me. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'm not going to do too many more question one. That's not usually one that people have trouble with. Let me submit that. But I am going to do a bunch more of these number twos because that, that seems to be what people really struggle with is these reactions. Okay. So CH3ONA plus HNO2. Now use the information that's given to you. Right? You're told it's a weak acid, which makes it H plus and NO2 minus. I'm gonna stop there for a second. Does anybody have any trouble with why I was able to split this up that way with the knowledge that HNO2 was a weak acid? Seriously, folks. So Zero. it will always split like that because the acid will always split to a, a an H plus, right? That's right, Marta. Okay. But if the acid is H plus, it means whatever else it's with is going to be negatively charged in order to maintain neutrality. Okay. Now the other one, based on the same knowledge as we had before, if we look at the period table, we've got the Na here. That's going to be Na plus. And the other thing is going to be negatively charged. Any questions about this part? So, I mean, these are the only two cases that we deal with. Sometimes we'll have the, the ones with the metal ions in there, which case we just split them apart. And in the other cases with this, with the bases, you'll have an actual OH minus you can work with. You I mean, you'll see it because it's with, a, with something else. But it's again, it's going to be the same thing anyway. But you'll just split apart the ion, and whatever's left will be OH minus. So the CH three O minus will join with the H plus, and the Na plus will join with the NO two minus. So we'll end up with CH three OH plus HNO two. Sorry, not HNO two. NaNO two. Any questions? Any questions? Let me 
see if I can. No, I can't. I don't think I can anyway. No. This is an interesting one. Mm, yes, this is interesting. All right. Why don't you all try and give this one a go? Mm, this one's a little harder, but uh, I'll, I'll let you guys have a go. Then I'll show you the answer in a second. <clears throat> Okay, so you've got, this is going to be the, it says strong base. This is a weak acid. So how do I split this up? So it'll be H plus and then NaSO3, that'll be negative. So that whole thing ends up being the negative portion. That's a little tricky, isn't it? Over here, it's the same thing as what we did earlier. So the CH3O minus joins with the H plus, that gives CH3OH, and the Na plus joins with the NaSO3, and we get Na2SO3. Any questions? I find it hard to believe. Usually somebody asks, why, why didn't I split the Na from the SO3? Well, the answer is I, I guess I could have, but you know, the, the thing is that I know it's a weak acid. So I know it's just the H plus I'm interested in. And, you know, when you're trying to figure out which, which is which, it's easier just to split the H plus out and put a negative charge on whatever's left. And but regardless of what that is. And you'll notice that the pattern, you regardless of, of where things are in the equation, the negative is always joining with the positive on each side. So it's like two couples dancing and they switch partners. It's just a double displacement process. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Dr. Musgrave? Yes, Lonnie. Um, just a quick question. So how are we able to recognize when in the uh, chemical reaction, you know, as to when it's gonna be a double 
replacement. It's always going to. It's always going to be a double displacement. Always, every single okay. time. Yeah, every single time. And, and what about? And, go on. The uh, case where you where you uh, basically separated the uh, two. Um, what was that? Also a double displacement. Where I did sorry when I separated. What are you talking about, Lonnie? Which which part? I, you had did a problem um, a, a short while ago where you separated, uh, I think it was NA from um, the rest of the. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, are you more right. concerned about why I'm not separating the NA from this one? Right. I mean, like that will be a double displacement here. But what about the other one that you just did? Uh, well, in, no, no, the thing is that this they're all double displacements, everything I've been doing. But when you're dealing with a weak acid, you always just take out the H plus and just leave the rest, no matter what the rest happens to be. Okay. And you're always told what the weak acid and the and the and the base is, so you, there's never any mystery to that. You don't have to remember anything. Okay. Thank all right. You. Why don't you all try this one here? Try this one here, please. Okay, so with this one, the weak acid, a uh, very strong acid, I should say, is HF, which admit, splits into H plus and F minus. And then the weak base will split into Na plus and HCO3 minus. So I'll look at the chat in a second. The NAF joins together and then it'll be H2CO3. the other one, the H plus joining with the HCO3 negative. All right, any questions? I have a quick question. Yeah. yeah. So I saw in the chat that somebody put the HCO3H. Yeah, uh-huh. That's what I put also. Is that wrong? No, it's not wrong, but the okay. test the test will mark it wrong. Okay. But if you were to do that and, you know, you could always just email me and say, well, listen, you know, this is correct. Okay. It, you know, it just takes certain, certain kinds of answers, the ones it's expecting. Sometimes you can arrange things differently and still have the correct answer. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any other questions? So yeah, so Jared, yeah, HCO3H should be okay as well, but um, generally we wouldn't express it that way. We'd express it as H2CO3. We combine, we, we, we tend to combine the atoms in, the, in that instance. Any other questions?
All right. Okay, how about this one? I'll go ahead and do this one. We got the strong base there. That's the KOH. That's going to split into K plus and OH minus. But again, we're just following that same pattern for the strong base, aren't we? And then for the weak acid, again, we split apart whatever we have away from the H plus. We know the OH minus will combine with the H plus. We'll get H2O out of that. And then the K plus will combine with the rest of the anion over here. And that will be our, that'll be our final answer there. Does anybody have any questions? So again, the, the steps that you're following here are always with the acid, split out the H plus and just leave whatever else is negative. With the, with the base, if there's a metal ion, just split out the metal ion, whatever else is negative. Join the positive parts with the negative parts on each side. And you should end up with two neutral compounds at the end. And they both should give you your answers. Does anybody have any questions? All right, so, you know, some of you didn't do that well with test one, but the main reason was because you didn't practice enough. I, I can tell you that that was the reason. So the idea with test two would be to start practicing much sooner. All right, that, that's my that's my advice. Start practicing much sooner. You, you do these questions again, again, just like I've been doing here. And, uh, you know, make sure you get each part done as I as I completed in lecture and you'll be OK. Otherwise, you're going to you're going to end up in the same situation as you ended up with in test one. And that's just not not going to work out for you. All right. Does anybody have any other questions about what we did today? In the last question, when we had a weak base, mm -hmm. it was we only had uh, the O minus, and then now we have OH minus. Like, how can we have both to represent a base? Does it need to have the H? No, no, because so like I said earlier, with the base, a ba the definition of a base is something you put into water that forms OH minus. So this is basic, actually. This is a strong base because when you put it into water, it becomes CH3OH plus OH minus. That's what makes it basic. The K plus KOH, when you put it into water, becomes K plus and OH minus automatically. And you can see the OH straight, straight away there for that one. So not everything that's a strong base is it's uh, you know just a and a metal ion and OH. Sometimes it's going to be something else that just becomes OH minus when you put it into water. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions? All right, that's one I'd recommend just doing over and over until you until you're beginning to get the right answers and you're seeing the pattern. If you have any questions about this, you can always email me as well. Also have the videos there too, where I go through this. All right, let's take a look at that and I'll just show you where the, the video resources, just in case you want to take a look at those as well.
so you can see these are listed by question, which are also in the in the quiz as well, you, you know, in the ungraded copy of test one. And I've got, you know, all of this, all this stuff here. Titration curve example one and titration curve example two. I go into the, into how to get the reactions in, in those examples as well. And also this is a pretty good one about buffering and when that's shown on a titration curve. All right, does any, anybody have any other questions? Okay, well, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we'll leave it there for today and um, we'll um, continue with the fun on Thursday. All right, have a good day. I'll see some of you in lab pretty soon. Thanks, Professor. Okay, bye. Thank you.